kind of building, residential, office, mixed-use hotel, industrial, doesn't matter. Pick any kind of building and tell us how you see tech changing it or reshaping it in just the next five years. What will be different about it? Why, how, how are you seeing it? And don't forget to tell us who you are. <laughs> handling the marketing and business development for the firm. I'm also very focused on analyzing new technologies and implementing different technologies within the firm. I'm also really involved in the design aspect of a lot of the new development projects we're working on. For example, the Miami Central project in downtown and several other ones that are in the pipeline. So I'm really involved in helping and working with the architects and developing um, ideas and concepts that will be what tenants are looking for in the near future. Right. So that's a little bit of background on me and why I'm here today. And to answer your question, I'm definitely picking an office building since that's our area of expertise. Um, and we're already seeing a lot of changes. So a lot of the buildings you are gonna see in the next three years have a lot of the things I'm gonna mention right now. So a building in the future, uh, definitely sustainability is gonna be key. Um, a lot of the buildings are highly efficient. Uh, Transit-oriented development um, is key as well. We're going to see a lot of mixed use. We're not going to see standalone office buildings anymore. Uh, everything's going to be mixed use. Um, if it's not in an area that's along a rail line or something that connects to mass transit, we are going to see creative ways where landlords are going to incorporate and provide that availability for you to connect to mass transit. Uh, very little parking, lots of creative amenities, uh, co-working spaces are key right now. So landlords are really uh, reshaping the way that they're building the office buildings and providing really creative amenities uh, for tenants uh, that really provide that collaborative space outside of their office. Um, so in a nutshell, solar uh, as well, as well as a lot of technology. So we're gonna see not just technology from a basic Wi-Fi in common areas, but we're gonna see it ad adopted from a property management standpoint as well. Um, a lot of IT redundancy throughout the buildings, and again, we're, we're already seeing a lot of that now, but we're gonna see a lot of what uh, Jeff had mentioned earlier today, so that, that's what we expect, and we'll see it in the, in the near future, not far-fetched. <laughs> so five years or less, you think? Uh, I'm thinking more like two years, okay. even a so year. Even, so less. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. You'll see some of the new buildings. You'll be really impressed with, with what's on the radar. And, and a lot of the things that you mentioned is already uh, taking shape mm -hmm. in the office right. uh, market. So uh, Jose and, and John, my fellow SIORs, it's great to be here with both of you. Um, Jose, they call you Mr. Amazon or something like that. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us who you are, and hopefully you're going to pick an industrial building. But you don't have to. <laughs> but... Well, thank you so much. My, my name is Jose Juncadella. I'm principal and senior advisor for uh, Fairchild Partners, our firm. Um, I've been a commercial broker for over 30 years, and uh, I've always been involved with technology, mostly in our field, in the commercial uh, broker's field. Uh, you, know, you know, it's very impressive what you presented. Uh, the way we used to do business 30 years ago is not the way we used to do business 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or even five years ago. And I think it's important for all of us to understand that uh, we have to evolve the same as our technology. Uh, I do see change, uh, changes in every, uh, you know, I'm a commercial, I'm an office and industrial uh, broker. Uh, of course, a lot of the new technology is easier seen in the office buildings. Uh, it's very easy now to go to one of Teres building and in Brickell and, and you know where the parking space is open because there's a light that tells you where it is. Uh, it's interesting to go to the uh, lobby, and the elevator will take you directly to your floor. Right. Um, and I know there's a lot of energy management systems, we, including in the all new uh, buildings. Uh, we are involved in a building called Somi Station. So it's in South Miami. It's uh, connected to the uh, Metro Mover. So, and uh, in any new building, and every in almost every. Uh, I get involved in a lot of the early stages of the new development and all the new technology is going to be there. Uh, there's going to be a lot of motion sensors. There's a lot of sensors that will detect when you're arriving, what parking space is available, what floor you're going, and also the temperature that uh, your office will be. Uh, the same we're seeing in industrial buildings. You know, years ago, we used to have the HID lights and so forth. Now we're looking at LED lights, motion detector, 
uh, tremendous amount of energy saving systems throughout, uh, including the construction technology that we're seeing in a lot of buildings. Of course, uh, parking is going to be an issue coming into the future, uh, but there's a lot of uh, thought going into uh, what the cities uh, have, are going to do. Have you seen, or uh, maybe either of you, um, the circadian lights, the circadian LEDs that automatically, through building controls uh, or through a combination of software and building controls, dim and brighten through the course of the day depending on how much light is in the room, coming in from outside, how many people are in the room, what time of day it is. So it optimizes productivity of the workers in the room. It also optimizes the energy consumption, but the changes are so small that it's imperceptible to the people that are there working. Are you familiar with that at all? I, I've heard about it as well as the color of the lighting. Yeah, uh, the color as well. Which is, which is changing. I mean, there's not only on the lighting, but also on the shades, depending on the sun situation. Uh, it's also, all that technology is already available. Uh, now, it's gonna be implemented more and more as, uh, as the pricing drops. Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, Moore's Law, and uh, you know, the Moore's Law also applies to, to pricing as more technology develops in the future. So we, uh, we just redid our office space at Newmark in, in the O'Hare, uh, Chicago area, about 11,000 feet of office space. We just moved in. Um, I spec circadian lighting, because I'm, you know, of course, a, a tech <laughs> nerd, and, and uh, um, it's a real yawner. Everybody in the space knows it's there, and they're just like, Jeff, I don't get it. Like, Nothing changes. I'm like, that's the whole point. You're not supposed to notice, <laughs> right? It's hard to tell if it's really working or not. But it, it's real because it it, it's already in use. Yeah. So thank you very much for being sure. here. We appreciate that. My pleasure. John, you and I have talked about technology many, many, many times. Uh, too many to count, probably. Uh, everybody in the room, I think, probably knows you. But tell us who you are, uh, and then tell us, you know, how you see buildings change in the next five years. I'm uh, John Dillon. I'm your 2015 chairman of the board of this group. Uh, former president of the state, SIOR, as Jose was. Uh, I do a good bit of uh, advisory work in a real estate capacity for the Department of Transportation. I'm the um, uh, Freight Transportation Advisory uh, Committee liaison from Pepe Diaz here in Miami. I'm on the Freight Transportation Advisory Committee of uh, the uh, MPO in Broward County, the Master Planning Committee for Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport, and do a lot of work with Port Miami and Port Everglades in terms of advising on uh, real estate that's available for the importation of perishable goods and all that. So, wow, I see, I see very slow changes is the trouble. And I do, because I think one of my biggest responsibilities is to the public and the, uh, the building of structures that we know are going to last for a very long time or should and we're building them in such a way that they're not adaptable. Uh, we're, we're being pushed by people because of immediate needs to build parking into facilities, to build the facilities other than in downtown areas in such a way that they accommodate vast amounts of service parking, knowing full well that 15 years from now, we won't be living like we are now. Responsible yeah, levels, and, and, and it was timely because the, the trip here this morning for probably everyone like it was for me, you get off the expressway, you go bumper to bumper, you come here to this facility, and the facility is designed around parking. We park one place, we walk around the building, all that will change, and we won't see any of it. We'll see different ways to go about this process for the next, I think, 10 or 15 years, but as we build these things, we're looking at public money going into new courthouses, going into uh, the, the rebuilding of Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport. We're looking at rebuilding the central terminal at Miami International. It's gonna cost about $3.2 billion to do that. Fort Lauderdale Airport's gonna be another billion dollars. And we, then we look for ways to move people around, but usually it's to move them from their cars to the building and not necessarily to get them from their point of origination to the building and to other things, you know. And we're looking at the, uh, Edgar will be talking about the Dream Mall shortly. Uh, it, it's just, how do we, we'll still have the cars coming there, but they'll be coming in a different capacity. They won't be staying. The trucks will still be delivering goods, but they'll not be sitting quite in the same way they do now. So we start to plan this for the Department of Transportation. We're, we're looking at truck courts that'll be somewhat different but I think one of the worries is looking out into the future, 
we sort of look at the past to give us an idea of whether that container, if it has a self-driving truck, will it be backing up in the same way? Does it have to open from only one end? Can a container open from both ends? Can it open from the top? Do you really need a loading dock that you back up vertically to, or could you back up parallel to it? Could you stack it? Uh, we see the industrial buildings that are proposed for the future in some of the events we go to that are multi-story. Uh, it's, it's really just because of the price of the land right now, but as we start to look at what a robot does, and we go through the Zappos facility, we realize that a robot can find something without having to look for like objects. Uh, so we, we design buildings that can be 60 feet, 120 feet high. The robot will go up to the fourth or fifth floor very easily. So we realize that a building that's built for the future now, as we're looking at things at Port Everglades, we're looking at a higher ceiling and ability to put more mezzanines to be able to get things up there. And you particularly um, are immersed in, in the autonomous vehicles and, yes. and parking. So let me ask you about parking garages. What's the future of parking garages? Wow, uh, I don't think, well, there isn't one, except what are we going to do with the ones we have? <laughs> they, they really have to be built with a 14-foot ceiling. If you build a parking garage- And a flat. To, and a flat floor. Uh, a flat floor that's load supporting, uh, essentially that has the ramps or the access to that floor outside the building, unless you picture a future use for that as part of the core. And really, th there's just a lot of different ways to look at it. Well, I hear people say build a 10 foot 6 inch uh, minimum floor to, uh, to, uh, to ceiling height, uh, but it's not adequate. It really needs to be more than that. I think that we'll probably look for parking garages that are part of the structure of the building, like the condos downtown, or become storage spaces. And they'll probably be very, very good for the people in the building. It'll be bad for the self-storage industry that's uh, looking, you know, to, to get all those people to store their merchandise. I, I'm afraid I have not been able to envision a use for the slanted ramp garages. Yeah. Do we have so much of it? Do you want to come in? Um, sure. Yes. So so we're seeing a lot of interesting things when it comes to parking. It's still a very big need for tenants in the market. There's still people that want their parking space, want to be able to bring their car. Miami's so spread out that it's really hard. We're not there in public transit right now to really get rid of our cars altogether. But for new projects like the Miami Central project that we're representing in downtown, when they built the parking garage, which is going to deliver at the end of this year, um, they did build it in a way where it's under the actual office building and they wanted to implement more of a robotic parking um, process. So it's an interesting way you go, you drop off your car, you go to your office with an app, you call your, you know, you call your car, it's down five minutes, you go downstairs, your car's waiting for you. We are seeing a lot of that technology implemented in office buildings today, the ones that we're going to see deliver in the next two to three years. Um, a lot of landlords have also talked about what to do with their existing garages and there's a lot of slanted garages that there's not much that you can do from a construction standpoint to fix that unless you knock it down and build it again. But we are seeing a lot of landlords take maybe a couple floors of those buildings and repurposing them with green space, um, outdoor amenity space. They're implementing um, you know, climate ribbons like the ones we have at, at Brickell City Center to do some type of cooling. Uh, they're using it for event space. You see it at 1111 Lincoln. Um, they use that parking garage for, uh, for a lot of um, events and different things going on in the community. We're right now working with Goldman Properties on the Wynwood garage, which it's not just a, a parking garage. They're actually gonna have 30,000 square feet of office as well as about 20,000 square feet of retail incorporated into the parking garage, so it's not just a standalone parking mm -hmm. garage, it's also gonna be repurposed right. uh, for It sounds events. like it's got that forward design yeah. element yeah. that, that you talked about. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was interesting with the 1111 Lincoln, that, mm -hmm. that was uh, Yeah, I hear that Wynwood is quite a neighborhood that's emerged there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish I had uh, well, more time for the trip, honestly, I would yeah. love to check it out. Uh -huh. uh, Jose, let me ask you about <laughs> Amazon. Am I right in understanding that you done some transactions with them? Uh, yes, I mean, w w what is interesting, uh, Amazon and, you know, you know, everybody's talking about Amazon and how retail is gonna change and everything else. I mean, three years ago, Amazon signed the first lease in Miami. That was 335,000 square feet. Uh, then they signed another lease for 160,000 square feet and now they're gonna be building an 880,000 right, square foot right. building. So you're talking about in a small period of time, 
Amazon has uh, will have in this market as of now, in the in the very near future, uh, close to 1.4, 1.5 million square feet of space. I mean, uh, of uh, footprint space. Of course, they use uh, the height and and uh, they have the, the whole conveyor systems and right. all that and multiply right. Right. the size of the buildings. Right. So uh, it just shows the strength of that kind of e-commerce uh, type of business coming into Miami. And uh, Amazon is only one of them. I mean, there's Walmart and there's plenty other ones uh, yeah. that are coming into so our market. Here, here's what I learned about that. By the way, this is, this is now not necessarily tech, right? This is old fashioned, develop, lease, um, absorption. Um, so last year, most of you probably know that it was a record year for absorption of industrial real estate. I'm sure it was locally, even though I don't know. I'm sure it was. It was, it was in Chicago. It, it was everywhere, okay? Uh, industrial as an asset class is on fire uh, across America. Uh, I've been to uh, Europe twice already this year. I'm going again in a few weeks. Uh, guess what's on fire over there? Industrial real estate, okay? I talked to some, some of my uh, Newmark counterparts um, in uh, India. And guess what's on fire there? Industrial, okay? I talked to people in Malaysia and Singapore. What's on fire there? It's industrial. And so uh, we, we peel that onion a little bit, and what we learn is Amazon is taking 300,000 feet in this building, 100,000 feet in this building, 800,000 feet in this building, in every city around the world, all at the same time. And I don't know if enough people realize just how profound that takedown of industrial space is by one User, so it was predict. So here, I, I got this from Savills. Everybody know uh, Studley Savills is a is a commercial real estate firm, and so I was speaking to the Savills people in the UK, and they did the research, not me, but they said that 20 to 30 percent of all absorb industrial absorption in 2016 around the world was Amazon, just Amazon. Okay, almost a third. So I just stretched the numbers a little bit. 25 percent. It's it, it's incredible. Okay, well, what does okay, that do? Consider in consider a market absorbed net absorption of 3 million square foot a year. I mean, yeah. only in a few sure. years, you're talking about a massive absorption. Uh, they also consider that e-commerce is only 9% of the entire retail sales so far. in the state. Right? So far, so far. Of course, that's increasing, but also 25% of all sales. I mean, right now that it's on. Uh, so uh, it, it is a, no, no question about it. It's a growing, uh, fast growing industry. And, uh, and we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of especially Miami, a lot of large buildings being built uh, for the e-commerce business. To, in, to, in, in anticipation of in anticipation. more folks like that. So, well, but, everybody is in some way involved in the e-commerce. Right, you know, Almost right. every company. Uh, we sign a lease, an international company that does air conditioning system. Uh, their whole business is e-commerce. And they took like 40,000 square so feet, but that's just an example. I want to do a very uh, non-scientific informal poll. Okay, raise your hand. If you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, raise your now. Yeah. Everybody, take a look around. Hold your hands up. Hold your hands up. Everybody, look around. Okay, everybody, just about everybody. And it, and by the way, how good is it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> right? It's a pretty good value at ninety nine dollars or whatever it is. Okay, it's completely changing the supply chain and, and how things. So we, by the way, you buy an Amazon Prime, and we're starting to expect same day or next day, right? Yeah. Not always, not everything, but more and more and more every day. So if you're shopping online for something not through Amazon or through Amazon, uh, through a third party uh, supplier, uh, and they say, we can ship it to you in five to seven days. Do you buy it or do you keep shopping for something that can deliver faster? Maybe you go back to it. Maybe if you love it and you have to have it and that's the only place you can get it. But we're conditioned now, same day, next day, same day, next day. And pretty soon it'll just be same day. Okay, and Amazon's leading the pack and they're gonna have so much infrastructure around the world, it's gonna be easier to fulfill through them than to duplicate their infrastructure with your own, although many will try, Walmart's trying, others are trying, right? Yeah. So industrial's got a very bright future for a while because of all this e-commerce and supply chain retrenchment, but office, mixed use, um, hospitality, uh, medical office. How do you guys see the future for those asset classes? We've all agreed industrials okay for a bit. What about the others? I Good. See, I see mixed uses that we're not looking at now at all. Uh, Different mixtures, combinations. Yeah, mixtures of office with industrial in the future. I mean, there's absolutely no reason a warehouse should be located necessarily in one part of town and the industrial, uh, the office buildings in another part. Uh, there's no reason they can't be stacked. Uh, you know, there was a great uh, thing that was done by Ware Malcolm, I think, 
uh, with the architectural firm that envisioned a Chicago building that was essentially a, a tall cylinder and in the middle of the cylinder, the core of the building was a warehouse. Essentially, it was everything that anyone in the building might need, plus all the shops that were down at what we call now the retail level. Uh, it would be the iPhone store, et cetera, and the robots would just go up the stack of the building there and pick up whatever's necessary. Uh, containers would come in from the port at a three level below what we would call the street level. Now, the street level would be all pedestrians, and below that would be the transit level, and then, you know, all this would be taking place in one vertical stack. You know, there's just, there's some obvious things. Sitting with a couple of the guys at Miami International Airport, we're saying, why is it that we have such trouble having people come in for training programs? You know, we have flight simulators, people come in from all over the world looking to do this, they're out, they've got to stay one place. Why don't we just have the flight simulator, the industrial building right there with a hotel on top of it, an office building next to that? There would be a, you know, a certain amount of services. I think you make yeah. a great point. You know what it reminds me of? I was in uh, Seoul, South Korea, several years ago with Realcom. How many people know the Realcom guys? So, so yeah. We went on this you know, exploratory field trip over there. Um, and you're, you're exactly right. We saw an 18-story building where the subterranean level was a transit center. The street level was retail. The first, it was 18 stories tall. The top uh, uh, 12 stories was residential. Yeah. The top six stories was a high school. And then on the roof was a soccer field. Oh, there, yeah. They're already yeah. doing it, right? Yeah. That's mixed use we wouldn't think about here. No, no, and we see jobs. I don't know if we could ever zone that, but, yeah, there's, <laughs> right? There's a couple in South Korea. Well, that's a problem. Is Louis Archambault here today? He, uh, Louis keeps pointing out something that's, that's complicated. You know, there's a lot of reasons why not. Uh, one of the reasons that is the financeability of this. You know, as we look at getting into the situation that we know we'll be in in 20 years, and I just think it's so critical, I, I kind of preach on this, because even the IRS, which is not the most forward-thinking group in the world, gives you 39 years to depreciate a building, meaning they expect that building to be viable and workable for 39 years. If you're building something that you know that there's certain things that are going to take place, the day that it's built that aren't going to make sense in 10 years or 15 years, why on earth would you build them? You know, so we're building the parking structures, we're building the building to work for today, but we're not building it. We're building to, the last of the great horse buggies, as yeah, they say, right? We really are. And the car, yeah. if not the rocket ship, is quickly coming down the road, right? Yeah. But we're not seeing that. We're still building horse buggies in, in that context, right? It's like right? that famous yeah. saying, you know, that we, we were looking for more bank tellers in the bank and never imagined the money coming out of the wall. It's, you know, we're, we're looking for, for more lanes on the highway, more easy ways to get to the building, instead of maybe looking at what do we do in the building and right. why is it over there? Why do we have to go all these places? You know, for the, there's a lot of residential folks who really understand better than anyone the importance of these uh, strategic locations. There's the home and the office. So, you know, we want to get those to be as close as you can. And then there's the school. If you have kids, sometimes the school is the first strategic location, then you're creating this triangle out of them. But, you know, is there a reason that that all has to be different? If it's inefficient, yeah. digitization will address it yeah. in, in, in due time, right? And again, we, we see this digitization that starts to fill in some of these questions maybe by itself. I, I don't really have an ability to predict, but I know that as we start to shrink the, almost like defragmenting your drive used to be, on your computer when you had to do that. Right. And you had all these little spaces and you would defragment it, would compress right. all this stuff. You look at Google was one company that positioned themselves to do that. They positioned themselves to understand the distances by the mapping. Now, uh, if you don't use your phone, you're kind of crazy before you get in your car. It could be a road that you take every day of the week. But it's always best to look at the phone and see if that's still a good road to take right now. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> because we start to look at the ability of Google to decide the distance, the time that it'll take to travel that, and starting to put these other facilities. Well, there's a lot of people in. think we're going to lose the critical thinking ability for ourselves. We become so reliant on the apps and the devices to do it for us, we're going to forget over generations of time. Right? You know, I mean, there's a lot of people who will have that argument. I don't know if that's true or not. I think over generations, we ourselves, as you pointed out in the one slide, that we, uh, we shape our tools and our tools shape us. 
I think after a period of time, we will evolve and adapt into creatures that work better with the digital technology. It's, it, I, it is one of the reasons Ray Kurzweil is so hell-bent on this it, yeah. concept, this, this, this spooky, I think it's a spooky concept of, of singularity. Like I said, I'm not looking forward to it, but I do believe reluctantly we're probably headed there. Well, as I get on closer and closer to being 70, and I realize I depend on these, I depend I gotta, on gotta, so gotta, many different things. I am all for it. <laughs> if I could get really? an implant to go. make myself see better, I don't have to keep cleaning these. I can hear better. I can think better. The ability to download from the cloud a thought that I I'm having trouble formulating or that I can't remember <laughs> or I, I can't recognize a face and to all of a sudden just go into a slightly different mode and get that face. Okay. Or the, the one that really could start a fight every night at a cocktail party is when you say, you know, you have a bad memory or how many times have you gone to on a vacation, something goes wrong. It's like the thing with in the Total Recall, I just download a perfect vacation with my spouse and we, we could have a better memory together. All right, so. <laughs> let, let me talk about something else that I think is, is uh, disconcerting with the math and with the material, right? Jobs. Yeah. Jobs are, are truly at stake on some level. Maybe not our jobs, hopefully not our jobs, but somebody's jobs, right, are at stake. I want to ask you guys, uh, Jose and Diana, you know, what are your thoughts on the reality of that? Could we really end up at 45% unemployment sooner than people think as a result of all this stuff? And if that is anywhere close to being possible in your minds, then what skills gaps exist and what new skills do all of us have to figure out? Either we have to hire somebody who has it, we have to partner with somebody, we have to learn it ourselves, maybe a combination. So it's sort of a two-part question. You guys want to That's tackle like a that? five-part question. Okay. <laughs> well, then you're perfectly suited to try. Okay. So um, I agree with what you said earlier. I think we're still in a very relationship-driven business. So I think that to some degree, there are a lot of jobs that still rely on the personal touch and that uh, personal interaction with people. When you're signing an office lease, you need to do deposits in the thousands or hundreds and thousands of dollars. You're not going to do that through a computer without never meeting the person that's guiding you to do yeah, something like that. I'm not sure like I agree that. with that. I'm not but, sure I agree with that. But um, I still think that there's a lot of... Um, brain power that's needed in order to dissect a lot of the technology that's that's coming on our radar there's a lot of big data uh you need a person to say okay i have all these analytics i have all these results how are we going to drive a strategy to meet the needs of what's coming on into the future so i think that there's still a need for for that brain power to really analyze information with it moves so quickly and it's such a quick pace that I do agree with having people that you add to a core team. Like in real estate, technology really is changing the business a lot. So you can't expect brokers to be negotiating deals and worrying about marketing the space and then also be keeping up with some of the technologies that are coming on the radar. So for example, in, in our company, we've invested a lot in additional support power to the brokerage team. So we have an analyst on the team. We have somebody like myself that's overseeing the type of analytics that we're doing, the type of reporting that we're doing for owners. Uh, leasing activity reports, we don't do them on Excel anymore. We do them through a leasing management platform. So a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, things that used to take brokers a really long time to do, we've been adding the, the manpower and the right technology to make sure that we're streamlining that type of operation. Um, I'm seeing it in marketing like crazy. There's a company now that you can reach out to that has on-demand graphic designers. So we have, you know, a building that we need so to So there's that worker as a service, by the way, right? That, yes, that and we're seeing that more and more, I think, in real estate, especially in the construction industry. You need workers for a specific project. It's something that you have people on demand all the time that can work 24-7. You have a shift in the morning. You have a new shift coming in in the afternoon. Um, on the marketing perspective, we're seeing it a lot. We need a video really quick to market a space. There's a company that you can go to, gives you the talent and the, the skill set that you need for a particular project. But again, we are building a team where it's not just a brokerage team, but also a lot of experts in technology, a lot of experts in analytics, a lot of experts in marketing to really diversify um, the, the team. So I think that there definitely is skills gap. Not everybody knows about technology but it's all about bringing on board the right people that can help guide you through the process. Um, I mean, 
Again, you know, I know that you've mentioned a 45 unemployment rate. I don't see it in the near future. Uh, unemployment rate is actually continuing to drop uh, really quickly, maybe. specifically in South Florida. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe the type of jobs that are growing are not the same ones that were growing before. Believe it or not, manufacturing um, has continued to, to move Research, rapidly. Yeah. Um, even if you go solar, you still need the people to be able to develop and manufacture those things. Eventually it might be robots, but right now it's not. So as far as a 45% unemployment rate, I don't see that at least not in the next 10 years. Okay. Do you, do you have a, a, a chief data officer or a data scientist on staff, or do you think you we, need one? Uh, right now we don't. We do have, um, we just brought on a controller recently that has a lot of IT experience as well. Um, mine from the chief marketing uh, officer standpoint, although I'm not a chief data officer, I do oversee a lot of the analytics that we do and the technologies that we implement. So I think that a chief data officer will be part of a core team. As of right now, we personally don't have that, but it is in the direction of the talent that we're hiring. It is the direction that we're moving in. Um, it's really important, even from the marketing standpoint, for those two people to, to talk to each other because the way that we market properties, I mean, the other day I was reading about, you know, an Airbnb concept for sublease space where, um, you know, if you don't, you're not full time in your office, you get to post it and instead of, you know, sharing your house, you're posting your, your office space. So it's an Airbnb concept where all of these transitions from a marketing standpoint, we need to be in front of to be able to guide our clients in the right direction and make sure that we're thinking outside too. the box. What was it, Space Curb or something? Uh, I, I, can't I just saw the that name. too, yeah. That's there's cool. a couple that have popped up, but there's one that's really um, a game changer. So I feel like we're going to continue to see that a lot. And you need to have the right people on your team to make sure that you're ahead of the curve guiding your clients in the right direction. So. As far as a core team, it's uh, in the real estate industry, I think it's definitely diversifying where we're not just looking for people with a lot of real estate experience, but a lot of- uh, Well, you need a team, right? You need a quarterback, you need blockers, you need wide receiver, you need a running back, right? I mean, you need a team. You can't have all quarterbacks, right? Exactly. So, so. Jose, same question. D data scientist or chief data officer, is that in the future for your company? Uh, Maybe will be. Uh, we already have our chief marketing officer doing a lot of the uh, data uh, processing and so forth. But over time, it's going to be required. There's so much data coming in. I mean, it's uh, uh, you know we all have websites, uh, but we do not all know who's accessing our website, uh, who's managing, who who's calling, what are opportunities there to expand uh, any potential calls and so forth. So over time, it's uh, it, it, it will be grow like uh, having a chief marketing officer like you have and we have. Uh, it would be uh, it would be uh, it would be developed. Yes, I mean that there's going to be a combination of IT as well as the process of marketing and data, you know, understanding that is coming in, and uh, and definitely that's a field that is coming in almost yeah, every. Industry. I think so. I think there's an extreme shortage of data scientists and chief data officers, and then insatiable demand. I think it's one of the fastest growing fields. Um, well, that's how you build your minutes? strategy, okay. definitely. So uh, I think with, with data, the analytics really gives you what you need to be able to market the business and market the... So the I, I wish I could re cite my source on this, but I remember reading at the beginning of this year uh, that in 2015, at the end of 2015, the Fortune 500 companies, 23% uh, was in the low 20s, 22, 23%, 21% had chief data officers on staff. At the end of 2016, it was over 80%. Yeah. Okay? So that ought to tell you what the biggest companies with the deepest pockets are thinking and doing. And they're not just hiring ch chief data officers, they're hiring dozens and dozens and dozens of data scientists. Because between software and artificial intelligence and the ability to code and the skill sets that you, you've just talked about, you can sift through these hordes, these mountains of data faster and identify uh, what they call white noise or, or trends that were previously imperceptible that become actionable business opportunities. The real issue then is if you fund that idea and you're a big corporation and you have to scale it across an entire enterprise, how long will it take you to do it and how long will it take you to get your money back? And that's that ROI I like to talk about because not every great idea becomes an actionable idea in that context, but that's how you're going to find them. I have, I have a question. Since we have a lot of 
newer brokers in the office, uh, I mean in the audience, how does all this technology impact prospect in finding new businesses? Um, and, how, and, and how are you developing new businesses? And, and what advice do you have for people that are, that are you know, out, want to get out there and find new business? And, and how do you find that since we know now some of the ideas? Personally, uh, I'm doing a lot more data center work than I used to, like I talked about. Um, that's been a, a, a net outgrowth of all this for me. But I also um, talk to the chief executives of companies about different business issues than I used to, um, and I'm more valuable to them in different ways. I can talk about energy, I can talk about technology, I can talk about infrastructure, I can talk about, I'll give you a very good, for instance, uh, Cummins, everybody knows Cummins, a Fortune 100 company, and they make diesel engines, and then they repair diesel engines, and those are basically their two service lines. Um, and they're the biggest in the world. And um, Newmark, my company, is their global real estate service provider. We're their, we're their real estate department. And um, they were looking at a building in Chicago, and they wanted to sign a 10-year lease to do diesel engine repair. And I got into a conversation with the business unit leader about the future of diesel engines at all. And a net result of that was yeah, maybe 10 years is too long. Maybe we'll do a five-year with a five-year option. You're right. Maybe we don't need that facility for 10 years. And so that was a cons consultation. Yes, I gave up some commission. But guess what I have? I have a client for life, right? Because we talked about business issues, not about how much commission I can make by slamming you into that space for 10 years because that's what you told me you wanted when we first started the conversation. So there's all kinds of applications for it. You know, the limit is, is purely... Uh, your imagination or your willingness to try. I know you thought you, you wanted to, as soon as he asked the question, you were like, like <laughs> did you have something you want to add to that? Well, as far as you mentioned, pro like how do you prospect and what do you, how can you leverage technology, right, was your question. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think it's very crucial, especially when you're going new into the industry to really leverage a lot of the tools that are existing out there as well. Uh, we we just finished customizing our CRM to make sure that we stay in the know of what's going on with everybody, a lot of touch points, make sure that you use things that are automated. There's a lot of um, analytics that go behind websites now. Uh, right now we're capturing all type, types of data. We're in the process of, of rebranding and launching something in the summer that'll, that'll be really interesting from the marketing perspective. But there you can capture, you know, who's visiting, what competitor websites are they going to, what are they looking at, what are they interested in. And it's really important when you do meet with these people to be armed with all the information that you need. There's things like first research where you can benchmark an industry. So if you're going to meet with a new prospect that's in a particular industry, and to Jeff's point, you're, you're not just talking about their office space anymore, you're talking about their business, where their plan, uh, what their plan is for the next 10 years. And there's a lot of technology out there that will arm you with the research and the data that you need before you go into a meeting with somebody like that to make sure you're guiding them in the, in the right direction. Um, you know, definitely get very organized and get in the habit of the, the CRMs, the things like View the Space and Hightower where you're just automating the process of get, gathering data so that you can make a more educated consultation with the prospects and the clients that you're meeting with. But, um, you know, again, to his point, you're not just talking about office space anymore. They wanna, they wanna know that you care about their business. They wanna know that you know what you're talking about. And, and then you're equipped to service you, all their needs, and right, that's right. And it, so you need a cheat sheet before you go into uh, whatever meeting, and there's a lot of technologies out there, Hoover's List, First Research, different things that you can look at that'll give you everything and anything you wanna know about an industry and the biggest things that they, they care about. So you can go in uh, very equipped do, to do we have navigate. Time for questions or that's it? We're, we're pretty tight. Pretty tight? Oh, okay, let's give the panelists a great round of applause. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.